Hi, my name is Soumya Deep and Alexandra, my colleague and me, we'll be talking about ZStore, um, columnar storage for Postgres. We both work at VMware on Greenplum. So let's have a look at what we'll be covering today. Um, ZStore's goals as a project, its design internals, with, we'll be doing some demos. We'll be looking at performance numbers. We'll be talking about what we've recently done and to improve performance. Uh, we'll motivate open areas of work. And finally, we'll talk about how you can get involved with the project. Um, let's talk about goals. So we want Zestro to be a column store that every Postgres user can use. It's uh, very commonly requested for enterprise grade feature uh, that that's important. Um, also, we, it's, it'll pro provide another implementation of the table AM API, which is important other than heap. Um, being a column store, uh, we want to fully utilize the fact that the, we are going to lay out data column wise, which means we have to take into account compression. We want to be able to compress, we want it to be efficient as well, because we want efficient decompression. We want queries on subsets of columns to be blazing fast. All of this kind of points to OLAP workloads and bulk data ingestion, we want to be fast there. At the same time, we don't want OLTP performance to suffer. We kind of want to have and support the same features with Heap. And this is something we have seen with Greenplum as well. Um, we had on, append only tables, so you couldn't do uh, inserts and deletes and soon customers wanted inserts and deletes, uh, sorry, updates and deletes. So this is something we keep in mind when we develop ZStore. Um, we also wanted to have MVCC, crash safety and all of the good stuff as well. So I'll let, let Alex talk about the design. Yeah, so uh, from high level, um, Zestor is a table AM table access method that le leverages the table AM API. It also leverages the existing Postgres infrastructure. For example, it has eight kilobytes of fixed block size. It uses the common buffer manager and wall logging with its own some of its own custom wall records. And more interestingly, it leverages the B tree data structure to store column data and metadata. So you could think of a Zestore table as a forest of bee trees, where each tree represents a column. Um, and within each tree, each node is a block on disk. So if you have a table with n columns, then you would have n attribute trees plus one TID tree. Um, a TID tree has at number zero, it stores the visibility information of each tuple. So all of the B-trees are indexed by a 64-bit integer called ZStore TID. We are going to call it TED um, for most of the rest of the presentation. Um, ZSTED has a one-to-one -one mapping with the item pointer, so we can easily leverage the item pointer that is passed down from the table AM API. And because of that, only 48 bits of ZSTED is being used. Um, one important note is that ZSTED is purely logical. Um, it means that ZSTED does not tie a tuple to a physical location. That allows us to move the um, tuple um, in among different different pages um, when we do compression and b tree page splits. Now, let me actually create a Zestor table for us to play. So let's create a table full with column i and j using Zestor, and I also inserted some data there. Um, you can also set the default table access method to that store for the entire session. Now, um, I'll show you the one-to-one -one mapping between CST to ZST. So a ZST equals to the block number times 128 plus the offset. Um, now, here is a nice function called pgds pages. Um, it 
shows us all the D tree blocks um, for table foo. So you can see um, there's D tree blocks for attribute number zero, which is for attribute for the TID tree, and then attribute number one and two. And these are the information we read from the special space of a B tree page. Um, so now, now let's just look at attribute number. Uh, let's just look at one attribute for simplicity. So this maps to what I have in this diagram. Um, you can see block number nine is the root block, covers all the TIDs, and then it has three, ch three children, block number six, eight, and 12. Um, for each of the blocks, um, uh, it has uh, it has uh, the next block number and um, the low key and high key um, that covers the 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 TID ranges um, starts from low key and end with high key and then we can see the number of items that is stored on the block and we'll talk about what the items are next um, and then you can see the actual size of the block and the uncompressed size of the data that is stored on the block. And we can see we actually got pretty good compression ratio here for this particular column. So this is B3 pages. And it also, also the B3 pages take the majority of the, is the majority, majority of the pages for the table. But we do have other types of pages within the same raw file node. Um, let me show you this. So here's the inspect function called PGDS page type. It given a table and a block number, it tells us the type of page of this, uh, the, the, the type, the page type of this, this block. So um, this query shows us the counts of each type of blocks for this table. And if I insert one more oversized item and then run the same query again, you can see that the three free pages are converted to a undo page and toast pages. So these are actually all the page types we have, we could have, we could have um, for a Z3 table. Now let's go back to the slides and I'll explain um, what these types are. So a meta page stores um, all the block numbers, the block numbers of all the root blocks for each attribute tree and the TID tree. And the free pages are the pages we pre-allocated or recycled from other types of pages. The undo page stores the visibility information of a tuple. It is pointed by a item um, on the leaf page of the TID tree. And then finally, there's toast pages where we store the oversized data. So these are all the types of pages we could have for a Zestor table. All right. So in this slide, we'll talk about what an insert of a single row looks like for Zstore. So we're trying to insert the row hello42 and all that into the table foo. The first thing that needs to be done is the tuple buffer corresponding to foo needs to be located in the backend's backend private memory. Um, we have a hash table of tuple buffers keyed by the rel ID. So the tuple buffer acts as a space where we can stage uh, data before, they, before it gets pushed onto the shared buffers. Um, so the first thing that we have to do after locating the tuple buffer is to give this new tuple a TID. You can take the TID from the TID reservation if one TID is available there. Else, uh, what we have to do is insert a single TID into the TID tree. Let's say we get five out of that. Five is the new ZS TID for the, uh, for the new tuple. So once we are armed with that TID, what we can do is we can push each datum along with the TID into the corresponding at buffer uh, for the attribute involved in the insert, in which case we have hello and 42 being uh, pushed down to these at buffers. For every attribute tree, you'll have an at buffer. So uh, the at buffer is, is, is a staging area for all of the datums for that attribute. Now, it is, has also two layers. First, there's a buffer of 60 
three parallel arrays of tids, datums, and is nulls, in which we'll try to store five and hello, five and 42, um, respectively. Um, if there is not enough space in this buffer, however, what we'll do is, sorry, what we'll do is we'll push the data into the at stream buffer. Now, the at stream buffer is an in-memory representation of all of the um, in, of all of the data that you can find on an attribute tree leaf page. And this is what it kind of looks like. Um, so we'll push data there. Um, you can see it, represent, it's, it represents a range of TIDs. It, and this is the data section uh, between cursor and length, which act, represents the actual datums um, and things like that. So we'll go into the into details later of that. Um, so finally, um, what may happen is your at stream buffer is full. Then with the CSBT add buffer flush, you'll actually flush the data onto the page. So this is how an, and a flush may happen, not only by an insert, but from other sources as well, for other reasons as well. We might need to flush these buffers. Anyway, so this is how the data ends up into the at trees and the tit tree. Um, with what a single insert looks like. Now we'll talk about um, what projection looks like. So for sequential scan for a column store, it's very important that we pass down what columns need to be scanned. Otherwise we'd be ending up scanning the entire table. So here we have introduced a new table AM API called begin scan with column projection um, for this purpose. So next, um, we'll look at uh, what set store aim get next slot looks like. Um, so the first thing that function does is, which is basically going to return a single row, um, thing that it first does is goes and does a scan on the tree to get the next state in the scan. Then it calls at or fetch uh, for every attribute involved in the scan, in which case we have select i and j, so the two attributes, with the tid that was returned. So in here, we return the datum a, which corresponds to the uh, tid five. And similarly, we return 42 for this other attribute. Finally, we have all, of, all the uh, attribute datums we need as long as the tid and visibility information. So we fill all that up and return the slot. And there you have it, a row is returned. Okay, now let's zoom in and look at the page layout of the B tree leaf pages. Um, we'll talk about the TID tree first and then we'll talk about the attribute tree. So for the TID leaf page, um, it has pretty similar structure with a regular heap page. Um, it does um, take advantage of the special space at the end of the page to store a DSB tree page opaque structure where we have all the B tree specific metadata. Um, I've actually already shown you what they are from the PGDS B tree pages inspect function. And then between PG up, PD upper and PD special, we store a array of ZSTID array items. So within each item, we have a header that stores the first head and the last head um, for this array item, and then the sizes of the other sections of the item as well. So for, and then following the header, we store a set of TIDs. So um, know that we don't do compression for the TID array, but we want to, we still want to store things as compact as possible. So we, did, so we have done the simple AB um, encoding for the group of the TIDs we store, where we have the first TID with the absolute value, and then we store the B delta values for the rest of the TIDs. And then following the TID, we have undo slots and undo slots words. So undo slots stores the Two, up to two unique undo pointers that are shared among all the TIDs we have in this item. There are two special undo pointers. One is all visible to all the transactions 
and the other is dead. And then in the end slot words, we actually store indexes to this um, array of um, end slots for each of the TIDs. So as you can see, these are the mapping for the logical content of a TID array item and the physical content of it. Next, let's look at the attribute leaf page. Uh, it has the same ZSB3 page opaque metadata, um, but for re the rest of uh, the page layout, we have two streams of data on the, stored on the page. Um, called, they both are ZS add stream. So the add stream between page header and PD lower are lower stream and it is uncompressed. And the ZS add stream stored between PD upper and PD special is called upper add stream and it is compressed. So for a ZS add stream, um, there is a header where we store the size of the stream, whether it is compressed or not, and the last tail of it. Um, the difference between the upper and lower stream is that the lower stream stores a array of chunks um, following the header, whereas for the upper stream, we store the same chunks, but they are in the compressed format. Now let's look at what we have um, in a chunk. So within the chunk, we again had we store the set of TIDs um, that are encoded for this chunk. Um, is kind of we kind of use the same strategy as what we did for the ZS TID array item, where we store the TID and their delta uh, values, um, and then following the TIDs we have the actual column data. And here you can see these are the mapping between the logical content and the actual encoding we have on disk. Now let's look at what we have done for the oversized item. So a the item is oversized, is oversized when it cannot fit on a block. And in that case, we first pass the value to the toast compressed item function. It is the same function that heap table uses to compress the item. So we do a PGLZ compression there. After compressed from there, if the that we'll look at the size of the datum again, the compressed datum again. And if the compressed datum can fit on a block, then great, we just write that um, to the chunk as a inline compressed datum. And if it does, still does not fit on the block, then we write the compressed datum to um, the external toast, well, we write a compressed item to uh, a toast page or a set of toast pages, and then we store the pointer to the head of the toast page in the, in the chunk. So notice that um, for both inline compression and external toast page, we store the PGLZ compressed item there. So when we actually compress the chunk, we actually have double compression. One is PG LZ compressed, um, and then again, we do LZ for compression on top of the chunks. Now, you have known everything we write on desk. Uh, I'll hand it over to Deep to explain why we store things this way and how we do compression. All right. So, yeah. So, we'll be talking about how attribute data from your at stream buffer would actually end up on your page. So you've called ZSBT adder flush, which is called ZSBT adder add, which is kind of the routine that handles all of this. So we'll talk about how things get into the uncompressed area of the page versus when things get into the upper compressed, upper at stream, the compressed area of the page. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to descend to the target page. Now the at stream buffer comes with a range of TIDs. So it's kind of easy to locate that first. Um, once you do locate that, uh, then you check if your lower at stream, the uncompressed area has enough space to accommodate all of the datums that you want to insert. If you do have enough space, great. Just append them to the lower stream and that's it. Um, 
However, what happens if your lower at stream has stuff in it, and then you have to go and check your upper stream, which is the compressed area. Is it full? Then if it is, then we can't accommodate it, accommodate the uh, datums from the at stream buffer in that target page. So we need to create a new page. When we do create new, the new page, we make the conscious decision to fill, or to put everything inside the compressed region. So we compress the ad stuff from the ad stream buffer, take it and put it in the upper ad stream. Uh, this is what we call a repack operation. Um, now, it may so happen that we can't accommodate all of the uh, datums in the target page, which can happen because an ad stream buffer is arbitrarily large. So it's larger than the size of the page. So if, in that case, we have to call ZSBT adder add again and again. So it has to be called in a loop. So let's back up a little bit. What happens uh, now if uh, your upper stream is also has stuff, your lower at stream also has stuff, and you want to insert something into the page. Then you, what you do is you take all the datums that you have in your at stream buffer, you take the upper at stream, uncompress it, take the lower at stream and create, merge, them, merge everything together and create a new at stream buffer. And then kind of follow the same procedure where you go down to the uh, target page and check if the upper at stream is full first. If it is not full, that means you can put stuff into the into that page now. Now, when you do that, you can you always repack the page. That means you compress you put in put everything in the compressed region, and you do this in a loop until you've made enough progress. Um, at any point in the loop, if your target page doesn't have any more space, you allocate a new page, and then you run the same thing. You take more datums out of that uh, big at stream buffer and put, put, them onto the tar put them onto the compressed area of the page and repeat. So as long as you made reasonable progress, then you can you continue in this loop. Otherwise, you come down to the same decision box and uh, you make the same decision as to whether you will need to call ZSPD at or add again. And this is kind of the flow of things of how things end up on the page. Now let's talk about performance. So the first thing that we want to examine is what the on-disk footprint looks like for ZStore um, versus uh, heap uh, in at reasonable scale. So currently we have in this slide uh, stuff from TPCDS, uh, some tables, four tables with scale 50. So we see that if you compare these two columns side by side, this first heap column and the first ZStore column, you can see that we get reasonably, we, we get half of the ZStore table takes half of the space. However, when you ramp up the P, the parameter P, which is the number of concurrent copy sessions writing into the same page, this writing, sorry, writing into the same table, um, you end up with bloat. You can see that the page for Z, the size required for ZStore goes up here. Um, to mitigate, and the reason for that is there are some inefficient page splits going on because every session is trying to write and might be trying to write into the same attribute leaf tree. There are some out of order TID inserts causing inefficient page splits. More details in the thread that is linked here. Um, and the way to fix it is to reserve TIDs, to reserve chunks of the TID space uh, in blocks of N, which, where N is multi-insert TID reservation factor, which should really be a guck. 10 is the default right now, but we'll be making it configurable. Um, anyway, as we have increased N, you see that the space requirement goes down drastically. In fact, we even beat uh, what we get for serial, um, effectively eliminating the problem. By increasing N, you can eliminate this problem. It's very workload sensitive, so you need to pick it carefully. A nice side effect of all of this is the decrease in copy runtime, which is the time taken to uh, copy, to load the data with 16 uh, parallel sessions into, the, into these tables, into all of these tables taken together. We see a decrease from 100 minutes all the way to seven minutes. This can be kind of attributed to the decrease in contention on the TIT tree because we are requesting blocks of TIDs. We, we are not making as many trips into the TIT tree as before. 
So which is, which is a kind of neat result that we got, nice side effect. All right, so we have also done some um, performance testing on single column projection because that's where a column store is supposed to be good at. So here's our settings. We use the TPCDS store sales table. Um, we use the LZ4 compression algorithm. Um, we have scale 270, um, which is about 102 gigabytes of raw data for the table. We run the test on two types of disks, NVMe SSD and rotational hard disk. When loading the data, we have run both serial copy and concurrent copies with multiple number of sessions. Um, here's the GUX we used. Most, these are mostly used to, twin, to tune the performance um, for loading. The most important GUC is this track IO timing that is used to show, explain, analyze IO timings. And the query we run is select a single column from store sales and we recorded the IO read time from the IO timings field of the external analyze. And for the code result, every time before we run the query, we restart the database and to flash the buffers and um, clear the OS page cache. So here's the result. Um, first, let's look at SSD. Um, there's really no difference um, between uh, serial load and concurrent load for, for SSD. And as you can see, the, the store table size is a little bit greater than half of the size of the heap table. But if you look at the bytes read we need, um, it is only 1.4 gigabytes um, rather than 112 gigabytes for a heap table. Um, the 1.5 the gigabytes includes um, both the blocks for the particular column and also the TID column. And the IO time is about one third of the IO time for heap. Um, look at the read speed. Um, the Zestor has um, slower read speed, um, but because it's, it needs to read much less data, so the overall IO time is still three times better than the heap. Now let's look at the result for HDD. So as we can see, the IO time is a lot more, a lot more than the heap table. Uh, we read the same size of uh, blocks, same number of buffers. Um, however, the read speed is really slow. Um, that indicates that we are doing a lot of random read um, from the table and rotational hard disk is not good at random read. So why do we have, um, why are we doing random read from that store? Let's go back and look at our beloved table full. Um, so if you look at the blocks of each attribute. Um, block, and attribute number one is actually doing well. Uh, all the blocks, the leaf blocks are actually sequential. Um, at least the logical number of the blocks are sequential. But if you look at attribute number zero and attribute number two, um, the blocks numbers are not consecutive to each other. If you look at the access pattern for a sequential scan um, for a attribute, for example, for the T tree, we do 4, 1, 3, 7, 11. And for attribute 2, we do 9, 6, 8, 12. Um, as you can see, these are where we have the random race. And this is actually a pretty narrow table. And imagine that if you have a much wider table, then you would have the attribute pages more interleaved um, with each other. And um, what we observe, um, is that we, when we increase when, when we increase the number of loading sessions, the, the random race happens a lot more. So here's in summary, HDD suffers more from random race than NVMe SDD, SSD. Um, and when and the concurrent loads actually magnifies the attribute page randomness. So to reduce the page randomness, Here's what we have done. Previously, we have one single free page map that is shared among all the attribute trees and the TID tree. 
Now we introduced the attribute level free page maps where each attribute has its own free page map. Um, and in addition to that, we introduced a row option for that store table called that store row extension factor. Um, so whenever it, it is default to one because we don't want to do it for SSD, uh, we want to do it for mostly HDD. Um, so what it does is that whenever the that store relation um, need a a new block um, when a request from the storage manager it instead of requesting just one block it requests this number of blocks and it will prepend prepend the actual blocks it requested to the attribute level at the end so in this way we enforced the um, we reduce the randomness for each attribute. Um, so whenever an attribute need to get a new block, it will first look at the free space map. And if there's uh, free pages there, then it will use the free page from there. So this is how we reduce the page randomness. And let's look at the result. Um, you can set this uh, row option to arbitrary number um, that is greater than one. Um, we have more data points but um, we'll just show this one for the sake of the presentation. Um, so as we can see, we do not have, we do not see any improvement when setting this real option for SDD. Um, for HDD, we see dramatic improvement when setting um, the raw extension factor to a relatively higher number. Um, as you can see, the read speed um, reached five, more than 500 megabytes per second. That is basically sequential read. Um, so, so far, all the results I've shown is for code is to run the query just once without any cache in the database or from the file system. Um, what I really want to highlight is that if we run the same query the second time, um, then for that store, it actually takes zero time for zero IO time because the um, size of the the size of the blocks and the number of blocks it need to read is so small that uh, which is 100 uh, 1.4 gigabytes it can actually fit in the shared buffers where we have set to 10 gigabytes. So this is where I think that sort of really shines. So. In addition to the single column projection, we have also done the similar test for select star. Um, we know that this is not what a uh, column store is supposed to be good at, but still we want it to improve the performance there. As you can see, when we set this raw extension factor to 4096, we have much lower IO time comparing from before, even though it is still um, admittedly worse than a heap. Um, so everything I have shown here, um, if you are interested, we have a hackers list thread um, that uh, has more data points and analysis there. Check it out if you are interested. All right, so let's talk about the storage perf test suite that we have for ZStore. It gives you a nice, um, whenever you run it, it doesn't have too much of data, like there's like 32 megs um, and so on. Um, it gives you a nice holistic view of how ZStore is performing. Uh, this color represents good results and this color represents bad results. If you see at, at your own leisure, um, most, of the most of the results we are good to perform well uh, for the OLAP, OLAP stuff. For, and some of the OLTP stuff we don't do that great. There's some room for improvement for Toast as well. Um, which is a pathological case, which I'll describe later. Um, much of this motivates open areas of work, especially, especially in relation to performance. Um, one thing I'd like to point out before I begin is that all of these are links to the hackers thread, specific messages, so you can follow later on after the presentation. Um, so let's talk about some of these. Making index-only scans more efficient. Right now, they just are index scans. So we need to improve that. Um, print improvements. 
So we need to be right now for a BRIN index, an index uh, may point to a range that ma can map to multiple uh, Z store pages instead of what the expected requirement of one page. It can map to multiple, so that's bad. Uh, we want to eliminate toast bloat, something that we saw on the previous slide. Um, we leak Zestro toast pages for updates and deletes, as well as there can be like uh, the final toast page or, or some of the toast pages can be extremely empty and underutilized, which causes the bloat. Um, we need to fix that. Going forward, we want to avoid full table rewrites for alter table operations. Um, for example, for drop column, there's no table aim API right now that gets invoked when you drop a column. We would like to be able to reclaim, we want an API so that we can hook into that and reclaim all of the pages for a particular attribute tree. Whenever you drop the column, we should just reclaim it. Similarly, other operations touching a few of the, col a few of the columns or a single column should not affect the entire table. Um, and then making updates faster and deletes faster. So two things, updates. If you want to update two columns of a 200 column wide table right now, you have to touch all the 200 attribute trees because you have to go in and update all the tids for, for the datums in, for, the, for the rows involved in the update, which is bad. Similarly, there's table tuple fetch row version. Anything that calls this, things like exec delete, or table to a lock and things like that, they expect a full row. Now, we don't need that. Uh, especially, especially we don't need that, for, and it, we don't need that because we all, all we need is a TED. All we need is a TED scan. So this is some e e AM API improvement as well that we need. Similarly, we want to improve parallel sequential scan, which is in great right now. We want to be able to stop midway inside an at stream decoding process because the because we are sometimes looking for a single TED. That doesn't mean that we have to decode the entire ad stream, which we currently have to do. Um, so uh, more of the feature work, more in terms of feature work, we want to be able to support column families. We, our architecture uh, supports that completely. All we have to do is coalesce uh, various datums belonging to various other columns into a single, um, single attribute tree. Um, at the other end of that spectrum is a compressed row store in which you have a big column family comprising of all of the columns. Um, that that's kind of neat, and it, and it you can get out of, get it out of the box. All of the architecture would be the same. Um, and it'll still be a TID, uh, still be a tree indexed by TID, and so on. Then you want to be able to reuse TIDs. We run out of TIDs because 48 bits. Um, we want to be able to recycle older dead tids caused by deletes and updates. In the long term, we want to replace our undo implementation with upstream undo implementation. Right now, our, our own undo implementation is just visibility information. Um, we want to be able to make that change. Um, making the meta page overflow right now, the number of columns that we can support is limited by the amount of space in the meta page because the meta page doesn't overflow. We have only one meta page. Um, finally, we want to recognize free space inside uh, partially full pages. Right now, it's too like too non-granular. It's at the page level, so if everything if everything inside a page is un unutilized, then and only then is it a free page. Um, compression. A lot of discussion on the upstream thread regarding compression. Um, want to be able to play with different compression algorithms and take upon uh, different uh, strategies for compression, including dictionary-based compression. And roaring bitmaps was something that Hadi from Microsoft suggested as well. So we want to be able to experiment with all of that. Finally, we have to make Planner aware that there is a column store. Some of the work we have done, we'll go into the next slide, but mostly things like physical T-list optimization doesn't work with Zstore. Um, so these are some of the related hacker threads around the main set store thread that we've contributed to. Um, first to relate to passing down the list of columns, getting it from planner and then passing them down to the scan because we don't want to scan everything when we have a projection list. Similarly, we want better estimation of the number of pages for queries that only require a subset of columns and this is something that's in this thread and then using the statistics and planner to get better plans.
And finally, the undo framework, which we've talked about. Uh, some of the tools you can use to play with ZStore, the GitHub repo, the inspect functions we have demoed. There's an Ansible playbook for scale testing. There's the storage perf, the slide uh, with the, all the results. You can you know, get that. Uh, you can run the regress test with these two, two extra options. Um, uh, you can get involved here. You can join the main the thread on ZStore. You can sign up on the ZStore channel in Greenplum Slack. And finally, thank you to everybody who has been involved in the project, who has contributed in the thread. Many, many thanks. And we'll go into Q&A. Feel free to drop your questions. Also, feel free later on if you want to drop more questions in the thread. Thank you so much. Bye. Now live with Alex and Samit, and we're going to give uh, the answers to the questions that were raised. Over to you. Okay, so we see one question. Will ZStore become an extension or does it need to be part of core? Um, so we want to have a calling store um, as in core of Postgres. It doesn't have to be ZStore. We are targeting, we, we try to have all the functionality we're targeting to be able, able to be part of the core, but um, we don't know whether it's gonna become an extension or part of core yet. At the end of the day, we want um, we want something that uh, any Postgres user would be able to use. Yes. Um, it would be nice to have it in core. Thank you very much for coming in and doing the Q&A session. Uh, I know that doing the talk offline and recording it at home is not easy. It's not easy at all. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for organizing. You're welcome. Yeah.